ha vingut des d'Edinburgh o Glasgow? Actually, from Berlin, no? You come from... Bueno, ella és escocesa i viu a Escòcia. Té una agència de disseny de serveis que es diu SNUC. Treballa en en la majoria dels casos pels serveis públics del Regne Unit i ha vingut a presentar-nos un cas d'innovació en els serveis de salut escocesos. Bé, several cases, no? Some examples. I, bé, us deixo amb ella, ja, d'acord? Hello. Hey. Yesterday I presented in Berlin and the crowd just said, so that was nice. Hello. So, um, I've only just made it here via Brussels. Uh, yesterday, I missed my flight, <laughs> so I'm a little bit tired, and I might speak a lot slower than normal, <laughs> um, but I have made it just, just here. So, I'm going to talk to you about uh, using design uh, to transform healthcare services. Um, my work is predominantly in Scotland, and we've got several cases that I'm going to share with you today. So the, to give you a bit of an insight into my background, uh, I am a product designer by trade. So uh, I studied at the Glasgow School of Art. I used to make chairs, uh, coat hangers, lampshades, um, a variety of different uh, products. But I felt that it was quite soulless, um, this kind of design, like just applying design towards making things look better or an aesthetic. Um, one of the first projects I did that I'm still immensely proud of, um, but it's a very old project, is redesigning the coat hanger. Um, this might not seem like a big innovation, but uh, it was a great project to learn uh, design. Really, like when I think about um, everything I learned about design was, was through this project. So the, for me, there's really like four core stages. The first stage being discover, um, which is about undertaking research to understand how people behave, how they do the things that they do, why people are so strange. It's going out to understand uh, the world and the environment. So to redesign uh, a coat hanger, um, I was asked to go out and look at women trying on clothes inside shops. Uh, I took a lot of pictures. I was thrown out of shops as well um, for, for being a bit strange. Um, and I looked for the behavior that people were undertaking. So. When women were picking up coat hangers and dresses and shirts off of the shelf, they were sort of doing this and, and going in the mirror and, and, and shaking like this. And I noticed that the hook from a traditional coat hanger would, would get in the way of your neck. So when you're trying on a dress, it would, you'd be finding a problem. So only by going out and understanding how people are using things was I spotting problems and defining what the issue might be. Then before you create your final object or your final design, you prototype. So you don't create this for manufacture. You try and try and try again, iterating until you have a really good design. Um, and then you deliver stuff, the final, the final product. Um, and this might seem like a very silly story to tell, but for me, it's where I learned everything about design. And now I apply this into healthcare services, criminal justice services, and, and working with governments to try and teach them the essence of redesigning a coat hanger, but for public uh, services. And design became really exciting for me when I realized that it could be uh, put into progress to uh, attack like big problems in society. So try and really uh, take on some of the, the challenging stuff that's out there. One of the projects uh, that I had a, uh, my first experience within service design was working on the post office in the UK. Um, we have a, a big kind of uh, a problem there with all our post offices closing down in rural locations, so in the countryside. Um, this isn't just about still being able to send your postcards or your Christmas cards or, or money to your sons or daughters. The post office in the UK inside countryside locations takes on almost like an informal healthcare role. So people like this in the center, um, who are the sub postmaster, they take on this role where they look after the elderly inside these communities. But with every uh, post office being closed down, there's quite an issue of lost services uh, within these, these areas. So we were tasked with thinking, how can you redesign this post office? How can you create something in the space? Um, I came up with the idea that if we used 
uh, the Royal Mail, so they are the van that carries around basically all the, the letters. Um, we could put a post office into a box and have it led by communities. So have members of the community come forward and offer to run it and, mo and keep moving it around. But I realized that uh, service design was, was a fantastic process to try and get complexity across. So try and actually explain quite a complex series of interactions uh, between people, between objects, between digital interfaces. And for me, uh, it kind of clicked. We, we kind of use this expression that you, you go, this is what I want to do. Because I realized that service design and design for me was actually about telling stories, about how people use things, how they interact with the world around them. Um, and, and for me, I became a, a lover of service design, essentially. Um, I'm going to show you one process diagram and one diagram only because I'm, you probably see a lot of diagrams in government um, and I've worked in government a little bit myself. Um, this is, who, who knows the double diamond? Is anybody? Two, okay, great. This is good. Um, the double diamond is a process that has evolved um, and been uh, written down essentially by the, the design council around about 2005, six, seven. Um, it's a fantastic way of contextualizing and understanding how we apply creativity to solve problems. Um, what tends to happen is, uh, as a designer, uh, from, from a product side, this center point here is normally where governments or public bodies will send out a brief. So they will say, we need a website that will help do this for elderly people. Or we need an app that will help solve this for Alzheimer's. So what I'm keen on doing is moving back from that center stage into more of a research and development phase to actually really think about what people need to recontextualize problems and not say we need an app, but actually question why do we need an app? What's the bigger problem here? So I'm much kind of more focused in this uh, first stage of uh, watching people use coat hangers, essentially. Um, so I run a company called Snook. Um, we, ba we are based in, in Scotland. Um, I'm originally from Edinburgh, and now we work uh, in Glasgow. Um, but we work internationally. Um, we really design products and, and services. I don't really see too big a difference uh, between these. I think everything is now interrelated, particularly now that we have uh, sayings like the Internet of Things. So the world is becoming ever more interconnected, and products and services and interaction for me is one and the same thing. A big part of what I do uh, with the company is make sure that the organizations that we design for come on the journey with us. So I used to work in government for about two years and I uh, wrote my master's thesis on how we embed design and all these processes inside the public sector. Um, and I recognize that as much as we can see design as a very valuable asset uh, to, to taking on big problems, we need to also work on the organizations uh, and the public sectors and local authorities that create the briefs and the tenders. Um, I'm on a mission uh, to make public services beautiful because I believe that they can be beautiful and not look bad like a lot of them tend to look. Um, and also put citizens at the heart of the services that are designed. So really put people uh, in the central point of, of how we are designing things. I've worked with a range of uh, public sector clients, many of who had never really engaged in design before. So we've been learning, they've been learning. It's been a, a big educational experience with our clients. But I want to start with this this morning. Um, I saw this great talk uh, on TED by someone called Dave Meslin uh, two days ago. And he, I think, contextualizes a lot of what I talk about. He, has, he questions apathy. So there's a, a lot of press, uh, a lot of media about the term apathy and as a general public, as citizens, that we've become apathetic, that we won't engage in our own health, we won't engage in politics, we can't be bothered to vote. Uh, if anybody saw the UK elections, I don't know what happened, but we voted for a very strange party because people didn't vote. So we question whether we have an apathetic society but Dave challenges that and he says we live in a world that actively discourages engagement by putting obstacles and barriers in our way I'll give you an example it's quite hard to engage with websites like this when this is your main uh, local authorities uh, site 
A few more examples uh, from some uh, pretty leading services in the States um, to a few more. Nice color palette there, uh, but, but still difficult to use. Um, and uh, it's just, it's bad, basically, really bad. Um, and uh, one from home. And I think these are barriers to accessing our public services. And we have this uh, across every sector, education, uh, criminal justice, health. Um, and it really gets me angry. There's a great, and you should Google after this, uh, campaign called the Plain English Campaign. And basically, um, and goodness knows if you understand this, because I'm, I speak English is my uh, native language and I don't understand this. Um, this is from some uh, policy. Um, and what they do is they, they translate um, how things are written. And I think that that is about design as well. It's about creating good content um, in order to help people engage with your services. I'll just give you a really, I'll, I'll read it out because um, I think it, it's, it, I, can, I can do it justice if it is read. Before, if there are any points on which you require explanation or further particulars, we shall be glad to furnish such additional details as may be required by telephone. After, if you have any questions, please phone. So you have guys like this working for public services, trying to transform uh, and design the way that messages uh, come across. And another part of uh, what I do is I spend uh, time, we, we call it customer journey mapping. So looking at the user journey of how citizens engage with public services on the front stage um, and also the backstage. So how organizations deliver the services that their citizens see. And we use this as a method um, by emotionally mapping uh, the journey for people to communicate back to organizations what does work um, and what doesn't work. But this question of apathy um, and uh, exclusion and barriers, uh, particularly amongst young people, is something I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about. Um, I'm getting really uh, quite distressed about the mental health uh, implications that are facing young people in society today. This is a quote, not the, the, the picture isn't attributed to this quote. Um, and I know it's cut off, but it says, a girl who was 16 years old in Scotland said, I used to want to be a lawyer, but school was crap. Uh, it means bad. I can't get a job and I don't do anything all day. So she's 16 years old. You know, like you have your whole life ahead of you and at 16 she doesn't do anything because she's left school, she's been knocked back and she doesn't really have a, a drive or a passion. And I don't really think this is good enough. I think as people who provide public services, we have a responsibility to provide for the next generation. I saw a great speaker um, from the BBC last week in Scotland and he said it is our responsibility we always see in the press and the media that we blame this new generation that's coming up. They, they're lazy, they have apathy, they don't care, they don't want to go to school. Well, that's kind of our fault. And people that are older than me, <laughs> their fault too. And I think it's our responsibility to design services in which uh, good services that work for people in which we can support them. So the first project on that note I would like to talk about is a project called We Got 99. And it's not, uh, when I see a lot of healthcare studies, it's often focused on me for around physical health. Um, but I want to talk today about mental health, which I think is an increasing um, scary uh, disease that is facing, um, facing our society. We worked with uh, Young Scott, who are a citizen youth charity in Scotland, the Mental Health Foundation, who are a foundation of mental health, funnily enough. Uh, they, they, they look after, they, they know a lot about mental health in the UK um, and ourselves. And we worked for NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. So there's some pretty um, stark figures out there that I find very scary. Um, one in 10 of five, uh, five to 16 year olds have clinically significant mental health difficulties. One in 10 children have significant mental health difficulties. And it gets worse. Self-harm rates for young people represent a significant public health issue across Scotland. 
it is estimated that one in 12 children have self harmed one in 12 children have hurt themselves because of the way they feel in scotland and these statistics are europe-wide and worldwide this isn't just in scotland we're facing a lot of issues as well around long-term unemployment we're trying to come out of a recession but this has been an issue amongst youth again not just in the uk but across europe Long-term unemployed children are facing a lot more barriers uh, than people who have been in employment or in education. If we just take the first statistics, um, we asked, uh, not we, but the research asked, I have been prescribed antidepressants. Of all young people interviewed, 11% said that they have been prescribed uh, antidepressants. Long-term unemployed, 25%, that's one in four of people in long-term unemployment have been prescribed with antidepressants, which I just don't think is something we should be um, dealing with. And then couple this with the fact that the landscape uh, of how we are using and behaving uh, uh, online is is drastically changing very, very fast. Um, This is a diagram that this research was undertaken by Young Scott. This is a diagram showing the dramatic fall in desktop-based use uh, use for computers uh, and an increase in mobile handheld devices. Now, to many of you, that's probably not a very new statistic. But when we were working with the NHS, we were asked to look at how digital media uh, integrates into people's lives uh, and what relation it has within the mental health uh, sphere. Some of the people I deal with on a daily basis, and this isn't a criticism of them, it's just a a look at their their behavior and understanding of technology. I get asked how to copy and paste out of a PDF document for people who are dealing with digital strategy in government, right? So people are asking me some very silly questions who are tasked with being in control of the design of new digital services. And that's very, very scary. So when when the use of uh, digital uh, technology and apps and social media is changing so quickly, um, people like public service bodies need to keep up with that. And I was uh, honored to work on this project with the NHS um, because they recognized that they needed to do something about that and they needed to get educated and understand how young people are using social media to manage or not manage their mental health. We were also asked to develop ideas um, for new mental health support services um, and also develop a youth guide to mental health online. So how do you stay well in a society that's got a lot going on uh, and a lot of things happening on the internet? So we spent time uh, undertaking one-to-one interviews with young people across the board, so either who had had serious mental health difficulties in the past um, or people who were just just kids, um, and we, we talked to them. When we take interviews, we, we just have a conversation um, because particularly when you're talking about issues around mental health, somebody's actually sitting with you wanting to tell you their story um, or maybe not wanting to tell you and, and get advice on it. So it was a very difficult um, set of research because we had to be really careful around the ethics of engaging uh, with young people in in the subject domain. But I will give you some examples of of things that we heard. This is Lisa, she's 22, and she says, I can tell that my mental state isn't at its best if I start spending too much time browsing on Facebook. Lisa is someone uh, who would spend maybe seven, eight, nine hours a day on Facebook not engaging, just watching, just sitting at a computer, not doing anything. Or Greg, my brothers say I spend way too much time on YouTube and it causes arguments sometimes. I don't think I do. Well, I mean, it's not like I have anything better to do. When we interviewed Greg, he again was very similar to Lisa. We'd go onto YouTube around 5 p.m. and go to bed at 1, 2 a.m. in the morning, just watching stuff, just watching videos. But for the more positive as well, people like Jenny told us about how they use the internet for positive well-being. So I like to upload an image of something that's made me smile, something to be grateful for every day. It sounds cheesy, but it keeps me going. So we found the good, I guess, and the bad. 
um, and we're producing both research on this, but also trying to understand insights about how young people use uh, the internet. So we took all of that information and we created design studios in local community centres um, with young people um, who were either engaging around mental health um, issues or not. Um, and we gave them the tools to design services themselves. So we put them in the, you say like you put, the, put you in the driving seat, um, we gave them design tools. And we asked them to respond to some of the negative issues that we were finding through our research. We created uh, bespoke visual tools in order to start a conversation with them around mental health. So you can sit down with a young person and say, and they're like, yeah, it's okay, you know. Uh, but by actually creating more visual tools, we're able to have a much more distinguished and established conversation about how they use social media, their behavior, their ideas. We use tools like this. The, the final artifact doesn't really mean that much. We might as well rip it up. It's more about sitting down and using it with somebody. So we would be asking people to tell us what kind of social media they use and how, and they would be drawing uh, onto it, and it allowed us to ask more questions and have a conversation with them. We tend in public services and government, I don't know if you think this too, but I certainly believe this, we tend to over-consult, which is we send people very big questionnaires and say, on a scale of one to ten, how is, you know, how is your mental health? You know, seven. It doesn't really tell us very much about people, the way people behave. So I'm very much into kind of much deeper uh, ways of researching. So, yeah, cats. I'll start with cats, um, as in meow cats. Uh, someone said to us, a young person, cats can be used as they naturally make people happy. I don't know about you, but I'm sure you've probably come up uh, and seen some kind of blog post about cats being cute or cats hitting balls or cats rolling on their side. Like cats seem to be uh, prevalent on the internet. Um, and I think this is a really interesting behavior and something that I had to explain um, the importance of to the NHS in Scotland. Um, we found that young people who were uh, looking after their mental health and others, their family and their friends, were using what we call um, animated GIFs. Uh, when I say animated GIFs, does anybody know what those are? Animated GIFs? So they are images that like animate, like move. Um, you've probably seen some on the internet, maybe with people like Ryan Gosling or um, Leonardo DiCaprio not winning an Oscar, you know, when he looks sad in a, in a picture. Um, what young people are doing is they're sharing images around mental health. One of my favorites is uh, the one on the left, uh, one does not simply ignore mental health. And I think it's really important, this may seem very silly, but it's very important that friends are recognizing other friends' mental health issues and sending them pictures on the internet in which to establish that connection between two people, that they understand that there's a mental health issue. Um, I also like uh, this one, which is a very angry wolf. Um, it says, I got 99 problems and you are all of them. Um, so I, I love this insight that, that young people who were uh, engaged in uh, mental health services, whether they had a psychiatrist or a clinician or a GP, and were meeting other young people, um, were sending animated images uh, to one another. So we took that as an idea and we ran with it. And we're looking this year, we've just put in a, a European uh, bid uh, to the CHEST fund to develop some of these concepts. Um, one thing that the NHS wants to do is to create, and the young people designed this themselves. We were really just the people that visualized it and helped them develop it uh, as we went. Um, it's called Support Squared, and it's a space where you can create animated images for your friends about mental health, but also put in proper clinical information into the back of the image. So when you share it on the internet, you're sending your friends some serious um, help information, um, but you're also sending something funny. Um, I don't know about you, but when I go to take some kind of healthcare service, whether it's at the doctor or the hospital, I get given a very big leaflet of like something that doesn't look very good is probably in Times New Roman or Arial font, um, probably size eight. And it, it's just a bit shit, you know, like it's not very good. Um, so 
using methods like this and redesigning the way in which we share healthcare information around mental health, particularly for young people, I think is a, is a good idea by them. They also designed um, different ways of social networking with each other um, that we'd like to take forward as well. They said that if the NHS had consulted with them in, with them in the standard way, they probably would have just filled out this questionnaire and said, we'd really like a forum to talk to each other. Because one major insight that came out from the research is that people just wanted to actually connect and support one another. But if the... If, if that public service had just consulted them, they probably would have built just a basic forum. So question, answer, question, answer, very linear uh, design. But what the young people wanted was a series of more nuanced uh, ways of connecting using images and being able to uh, catalog how they're feeling so that they can share uh, their mental health, their ups, their downs with their psychiatrist and GP um, by using images of seals and foxes and cats. And again, this might seem really silly, but this is what people wanted to use in order to try and communicate how they were feeling to various health professionals. My favourite one, and it's another cat, so I'm sorry, um, but it's called the Polite Cat Butler. This was my favourite idea that came out of the research that the young people developed and one of them even came dressed as a butler who had whiskers and as a cat when we presented to um, the, the, the NHS in Scotland. What it is, is it's based on the insight that many young people, when they're feeling mentally unwell and they hit a crisis point or a moment, they tend to reach out on Facebook or Twitter or their blog or Instagram um, or Snapchat or whatever it might be, um, and they'll just put a message out without thinking about what they're saying. And often that can have serious impacts on themselves, on their friends, on their family, because a lot of them are not thinking straight about how they're feeling. It's just an emotional outlet. So somebody came up with the idea that we could create a widget that would be inside your Chrome browser or Firefox or Safari browser on your computer, um, and it would translate your very, like, negative outpouring into something much nicer um, and it would make you think about whether you should post that as a kind of tactic in order to stop people from sharing not so good uh, like information online so from going from ah just off uh, to I just need some time alone right now it was like a digital translator for mental health so I hope this works uh, is this going to work good great um, so the youth guide uh, that we produced, again, not a big leaflet. Um, we created animated images which have information attached to them that we can share on the internet. Uh, we co-produced uh, the content with the young people that we worked with. So they wrote the copy, um, they helped us come up with the ideas, and we as designers uh, produced it. So we took on a dual role of being the final producers of graphics and animations, but also as facilitators of people's opinions. This animated GIF is about uh, looking out for small changes in your friend's behavior because that might mean that, they're, that, that there's something with their mental health that needs to be taken care of. The next one that we did was more of a challenge. A lot of young people, like Lisa, felt that they were addicted to the internet, so they came up with a campaign uh, called Switch Off Day. And we created an, an animation about anti-social media, Are We All Addicts? Asking people just to switch off for one hour, two hour, turn the phone off, um, and go and engage back in the world. This might seem like a really small thing, um, but there's actually an article that I was just reading that came out this morning. that Young people growing up are losing the ability to have small talk. So like, if we were to have a conversation, we're having a coffee, well, we're at this conference, we could probably talk to each other. But when you start looking at 13, 12, 11-year-olds, they're losing the ability to talk to each other, particularly in the UK. Because the first thing that happens when I run a workshop and young people come in is they walk in and say, what's the Wi-Fi password? And they don't talk to me, you know? So we're really facing, I think, some significant challenges around how we um, interact with each other as a society. What really um, got me excited about this project uh, is that we over-delivered something that we didn't intend to deliver from the original tender or brief that our clients set. 
The young people created their own manifesto for mental health, a policy, if you will, um, about how they want to be treated as young adults growing up uh, in the healthcare system. They want emotional literacy to be brought into high schools. They want teachers and schools to be better equipped with handling crisis situations because they're not very good at doing it. Mental health is still a stigma. Um, there's been a lot of work done, uh, in, I know, in the UK around recognising mental health as an illness, um, as, a, as something that is, is, is similar to, to physical um, health or disability. But in schools, we haven't quite caught up yet. They also wanted the health service to understand that mental health isn't just about the individual, it's around the whole network of people around them. So um, their family, their friends, their boyfriends, their girlfriends... People go around people. So they stood up to the NHS and said, when you provide services for people, look at everybody, not just the individual. And improve the quality of online content because they rely on it. Because online content is bad. Um, a lot of it isn't very good and it's very difficult to find. So they sent, and this is only three of about 20 different points that they made. If you can imagine, we stood up with the Director of Public Health in Scotland and all very high up people uh, in the NHS and we had a group of 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds standing up and telling them their manifesto for health. And the reason I love this project so much is because uh, I think it was driven by design, by using visualisation methods, storyboarding techniques, just like you saw with the coat hanger uh, and the post office, um, to create new ideas that I think can bring the NHS back up to speed. As a final thing that we did, um, I'm not a big fan of, of reinventing the wheel. Um, I like to look at what's already out there and in existence because there's a wealth of people doing great things around mental health. Um, the Mental Health Foundation that we worked with put together 50 examples of good practice um, from people working inside and outside of the NHS who have different uh, digital technologies that are being used in mental health. But we also looked at simple tools like Twitter and Facebook because, as I said, a lot of people working in the public sector aren't quite digitally engaged yet, so it was important for us to show what uh, tools are out there uh, to engage with young people around mental health. This looks like a very scary diagram, and it is, um, but what we did was map all those different tools that are on the internet and map them to different stages that young people might be um, in the mental health spectrum. So if you know someone is feeling suicidal, what digital technologies can you use to engage with them? I'll tell you a very quick story. I once supported um, somebody who was threatening to commit suicide um, and they can't talk on the phone because they have mental health difficulties. I was uh, Facebook chatting them um, and they asked me to call um, a leading charity who helps people deal with suicide. I called them and I said, can you please do you have any form of MSN Messenger, Facebook chat, WhatsApp to communicate with this person because they're threatening to take their own life. And they said, no, but you can text this phone number. So I, I gave the number to this person and she texted them. And uh, the text came back from the charity and it said, uh, hi, this is Kate from Charity X. I can't tell you the name, but Charity X. Um, how are you doing? When I started chatting to my friend again on, on Facebook, uh, she said, but Kate's texted me all this week at 3 in the morning, 6 p.m., 11 a.m., 2 a.m., 4 p.m. They were using a fake name uh, as a charity, a leading charity, in order to be more personable as a service, to be more user-friendly. But they were failing miserably because people are smart and they realized that uh, that doesn't work. So this person got more and more uh, anxious and I phoned up again and I said, you really need to help me here. They can't talk to you on the phone. They don't want to text your fake uh, person and we're in a crisis situation. You must have some kind of social media tool in which to converse. And they said, no, she will need a teleprinter. Now, I don't know if anybody's ever seen a teleprinter, um, but it looks like a 1980s spectrum device, uh, which is used to communicate to deaf people. So the point in being is that some simple tools that are already in existence before you create new tools can be used 
um, in which to embed into your services. And I'm on a mission with stuff like this to help uh, public services and health services understand where they can use existing digital technologies to improve their service and work for people. With our client now, we're looking at developing a digital springboard, um, which essentially is a platform where we can crowdsource all um, these technologies out there and, and tell case studies about how they're used for young people within mental health. But I'm really into co-production, so this will be used by young people, by doctors, by clinicians, by hospitals, everybody working together to understand how they want to engage with services and what technologies they can use out there. And this quote uh, is something that I, I took away from the presentation that the young people did. They said, make it beautiful and we will come. And I just think that's such a lovely thing for somebody to say um, and something that every public service and government should take note of. Make it beautiful and we will come. So I have 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to choose which project now to show you. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, this story. Um, this story is called The Brew Club. Um, this is based in Salford in Manchester, which is in the, the middle of the UK. We did this project in collaboration with the Design Council in the UK um, and Unlimited Potential, who are a social enterprise. In Salford, uh, nearly every street corner has what's called a bargain booze shop which basically uh, means alcohol for very, very cheap. Um, and it's on nearly every single, yeah, every single corner. Drinking has a, there's a massive issue of drinking within Salford amongst the adult population. Um, and we were asked to focus on women and men aged between about 25 to 55 to see if we could work with unlimited potential, the social enterprise, in order to try and reduce what's called problem drinking. So not alcoholism, because that, that's a different, that's a disease, but problem drinking. And everything that goes around that, so tackling things like social isolation, being connected to people around uh, problem drinking. Unlimited Potential are a organization that had 35 staff. Uh, they would turn over about 1.5 million a year, um, and they would reinvest that money back into their own social ventures so that they could continue um, as a not-for-profit to do good work uh, in the area. And most of their income came from other health services uh, and public authorities in the area. We were asked to develop a viable social business that reduces harmful drinking and its effects by addressing the root causes um, and try to reduce demand on statutory services and budgets. We had to make sure that it could make money as well, so a public service that could produce its own uh, profit. Make the activities involved with it affordable for people. Make it, which is like the quote I showed you, make it beautiful and we will come. Make it a high quality outlet. And I really like this as a brief from a, from a public service provider because they didn't want it just to look like another community center or a public service outlet. So, we worked with them uh, and took them through that double diamond design process to try and give them the skills to be able to continue to design their own enterprise themselves. Um, we worked with them over a period of about three months and took them out into the public to start looking at behaviours around problem drinking. We spent time giving them the skills, so the staff of Unlimited Potential, to go out and interview citizens themselves. I'm a really big fan as a designer of giving away design skills. I think that design consultancy, designer as the expert, is not really that valid anymore unless it's a depth of skill in film or graphic design or interior. But there's a new T-shaped form of designers who can look at how you design new ideas creatively with organizations. So we were giving them the tools in which to do this. And what we found is that people really want activities which are affordable, but they can come and do together and meet other people. However, a lot of activities that are put on for people are not things that they want to do. Um, so I'm going to show you what is quite a controversial, I think, uh, concept that we developed with them. Um, we came up with the idea of running a club which teaches people to make their own alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, we did. Um, it's quite a controversial concept, um, but it's, uh, it's contained within unlimited potential. 
um, so that we can teach people the value of creating good alcohol and not buying bad alcohol. If you've ever seen or known anybody who's lost a lot of weight, okay, uh, they, they learn how to cook because they learn the value of food. They exercise as well. But often it's been seen in research that if you learn how to use your tools properly, the things you put inside you, you can actually learn how to look after your body better. So we were teaching people about good alcohol because if we couldn't get them to come along to a card night and we couldn't get them to come along to a film night, so we thought we could get them along uh, to an alcohol night, essentially. But it's much more than that. So we called it the Brew Club. Um, it works like this. Um, we market the opportunity in the area. Um, we have a period of sign-up with people, so we have to go out and actively sign them up. Um, and then we run the Brew Club for about eight weeks, um, towards the end of the process, we create tickets for a final sell of the alcohol in the local area. And we have a big party at the end in one of the pubs. It's run by about three uh, different people. Um, we have somebody who's called the landlord. So we started using like, language that's associated with pubs and bar culture, but for a public service. So um, we have somebody called the landlord. Uh, the people that come, five to ten people on the course, are called the punters, which I think is maybe just an English phrase, but that's people who drink. Um, and we had someone who was the, the project manager or the, the landowner. So this is Andy, who works at Snook. Um, this is the chief executive of Unlimited Potential. And after mapping out, as you saw, like a blueprint of how the service might work, um, we ran a prototype of the Brew Club in one day in order to understand how it might work for people by acting out how the service uh, would be experienced. Um, Andy used, uh, it's a bit dark, but a variety of cordial drinks in order to um, pretend that we were brewing alcohol. Um, and we came together um, to, to try and design this. So we bought our own uh, brew kits as well. Uh, the equipment was, is very cheap, so there isn't a, a huge finance in making this service a reality. It's about 40 or 50 pounds for, for a brew kit. Um, and this is, this is great because you've got, there's more than just a design of a new service for me here. You've got the chief executive and his own staff working together to design the services that they want to offer to their customers. And that may seem like a simple thing, but that doesn't often happen in many organizations. You often get the chief executive, you know, right at the top, not really engaging uh, with, with many of their staff. So the end product of a brew club is that you create your own beer, you market it, and you label it. We put an emphasis on bringing people out of their homes because problem drinking predominantly happens at home, not in pubs. So we're bringing people together once a week, over eight weeks, to come out and socialize. After each brew club event, we also take people uh, to uh, different, different events. We take them to go and see a brewery. We take them to see a local designer who can create real labels for them. Um, and we take them out to local pubs to sell their beer to. There's a um, pub uh, called Brewdog. Brewdog. Does, do you guys have Brewdog? Has it come to Barcelona yet? It will be here soon. It's like a Scottish... Uh, we've taken over the world with beer. Uh, we've gone to like Australia and like places, Japan and stuff, so Spain will be next. Um, it's a Scottish uh, uh, local brewers who've gone really big. But they have the, their craft beer, so it's called craft beer. So you're not, you're not brewing, you know, really bad alcohol. You're brewing stuff that's about flavor, the texture, um, and this is what Brewdog does. And they had this wonderful initiative where they allow their taps to be taken over by other local craft brewers. Because uh, around the world, there's been a resurgence in, in making good beer. So we put the idea into a brew club that you could go to your local bar and take over the tap with the beer that you brewed and bring together your families and friends and networks in the community to enjoy drinking again. We can't tell people to stop drinking. We can, but they won't listen. We can't just take alcohol away from people. or well, we can, but that won't really happen. We can maybe make it more expensive, but people will still buy it. So this, even though being quite a controversial uh, service, for me is something that really works. And from some of the testing that we did afterwards, um, it would seem to be um, quite a success. But for me, I guess, uh, I'll just skip here, sorry. Uh, I guess what's important with this, this project, again, it's about teaching the chief executive and, and their organization how to continuously prototype and design their own services. Um, I think Chris got a, a lot um, 
a lot out of it and sees this as a process that he can use again. Um, and the design council as well, um, seeing that design could be used to generate quite an innovative solution in a very short period of time. The sad thing is, though, is that designing in the third sector is really hard. Um, unfortunately, Unlimited Potential um, lost one of their major contracts and now as an organization have completely reduced. So we're still in contact and hoping that we can build up the... Well, we have a relationship, but build up um, the, the service with them. The other thing is, and I kind of skipped over this point, but we have this thing in service design that's called a blueprint. It's a visual schematic, a way of putting down how a service can work. It can be quite complex, um, and it's kind of a big sheet of paper, essentially. Um, but I don't think they're that useful to people. I'm always actually in the, in the thinking that we should actually try and deliver the products that are associated with a service as cheaply and as quickly as we can. So instead of develop, giving a big report over and a big blueprint, um, we actually developed the, the running booklets for the landlord and the punters for the service as we went through this project. We weren't really asked to do that, but we thought it was a worthwhile thing doing. So that means that anybody who might want to run this service could actually come and purchase it from Unlimited Potential because they had a ready-to-go set of products uh, attached to the brew club. So I will run out of time, as always. So I will give you some final points. <laughs> uh, if anybody is interested in uh, a few projects, with I'm here for the day. So if you want to have a, a chat about stuff that you're interested in. Um, I'm running a new prototype called the No Sugar Shop, which is K-N-O-W. Um, it's about understanding sugar uh, and the impact it has on a society. We're facing a sugar pandemic. A lot of people are being diagnosed with diabetes. Um, so we're producing the idea of a healthcare store on the high street that's affordable for people to uh, understand the impact that sugar might have on their life. Do you guys know Take That and Gary Barlow? Take That? It's a kind of magic. Yeah. 1995, I think. Uh, I'm showing some age. Uh, it was my first concert uh, in the UK. Um, Gary Barlow has had a, he's a, in the UK, so he's like a big, he's on the X Factor and like take that and on commercials with meerkats and lots of strange stuff. Um, but Gary Barlow has had uh, across his life uh, a big difficulty with his weight. Um, and now he's in probably the sexiest, best shape he's ever been. You know, people are like Gary Barlow at like 40 is really, uh, really hot um, because he's lost a lot of weight. He's looking good. His skin's great. He took on a no sugar diet, um, but it's not just about no sugar. Um, it's about his exercise, what he's eating, the sleep he's getting. But what we're doing is trying to help people understand um, the impacts that bad things can have on your health. Normally, like if you smoke and you get like an image on the side and it's, it's like, like your lungs or like your throat or something really bad, or you get a leaflet, another leaflet saying this is bad for you. Well, we want to try and rebrand health. Um, and, and use icons and symbols that people actually understand. Because if Gary Barlow can look this good, then I can too, you know? So we're trying to brand health in this way and help, under pe help people understand where they fit on a scale of health when they come into our stores. So these will be like really big uh, installations inside the store. We've also created a, a series of challenge cards which are based around sugar, um, but just to be clear, I, I, when it comes to good diets, it isn't about just removing sugar from your diet. Um, there's a lot more to that, but we're using it as a catalyst um, for people to understand their health. So doing things like taking sugar uh, out of your coffee or tea just for one week, just to try it, see how it feels. I've got friends who have like six teaspoons of sugar in their coffee, you know, like every day, four times a day, 24 sugars. If I do the maths, I think that's 162, you know, that's a lot of sugar, a lot of sugar. Um, and it's not good for your health um, and, a, and a, a huge risk of diabetes. So we're creating challenge cards that can be, you can share your challenge on the internet. So if you've seen recent campaigns from like cancer, the no, the no makeup one, I think with the hashtag, no, okay, uh, but lots of campaigns going on the internet, on Twitter, where people are sharing, uh, like marathon running, fund me for this. So we want people to take no sugar challenges and share them with their friends. And we're planning to create a prototype of this as a shop 
where people can come in and measure um, their health uh, through getting their blood pressure taken, getting their sugar levels taken, and being given a really beautiful prescription, which isn't about taking medication, but about looking after themselves um, and, and take more challenges. For another project, if you catch me later, that we're working on as well, is um, this project has gone like off the scale. It's really big in Australia. I don't know why. Um, somebody in the Australian press must have picked it up. Um, but Valerie Carr, who works uh, for SNOOC, um, is working with the Technology Strategy Board um, and a variety of universities in the UK um, to develop an intelligent avatar uh, that could care for elderly in the future. Um, Basically, in Scotland right now, uh, every single young person who's at school in 10 years' time, if we don't do something about our care system, will be a carer. Every single, but there's not enough people to look after older people. So everybody that leaves school will be a carer. So we need to start thinking now about how we can use maybe technology uh, in order to, to look after people in the future. Um, the project's called RITA. And they've actually been working with the people that make avatars for films to create uh, a, almost like a... Valerie gets angry at me when I say we're building a robot, where Snook is not building a robot, uh, but we're building uh, an intelligent avatar that can check in with you, make sure that you've eaten, um, take some of your like, stats, like different stats from you, and take that data and work with your family and friends and GP in order to do that. Um, so we're building, uh, we're building a robot, I'll just say it, we're building a kind of robot. So uh, I'll just finish up. Uh, there are two projects that, if you want to talk about, they're very early stage, but uh, I'm interested in sharing them. So, uh, yeah, for me, and I say this at every conference I speak at, ideas are cheap. Like ideas, everybody has ideas. We go to the pub, we have concepts. But the innovation is in the implementation. It's actually about making things happen. And I'm a big believer in getting stuff done. This is one of my favorite writers called Ivan Illich. Uh, he wrote a book in the 1970s called Deschooling Society, which is a fantastic uh, critique of the world and very much aligned with some of my viewpoints. Um, he said, give people tools that guarantee their right to work with independent efficiency. I liken this to the Project 99, is that we gave people design tools in order to have their say, in order to, to create their own manifesto for mental health. And I think it extends into healthcare as well, is to not treat people like idiots, is to not put barriers up from our healthcare services, but to actively engage people in their own healthcare and the things that they want. So for me, what is good design? Uh, maybe one day I'll finally write a book on this, uh, but I believe that it is people-centered. It removes barriers to engagement between authorities and citizens. It's agile and lean. In that sense, I mean that we prototype and we test things before we implement them. It makes complicated stuff simple. It's designed for the transaction. And what I mean by that is that it helps people do what they want to do and makes it easy. Um, they're co-produced and they're beautiful. And I think all public services uh, should be beautiful. So I'll leave it there. Uh, as usual, not enough time to go through all my projects, but you've sat here for long enough. Um, and I'll leave you with this quote, which is something I leave everybody I speak to with by a guy called Buckminster Fuller, who says, we're called to be architects of the future and not victims of the past. And I think that it's within all of us to be some form of designer in order to try and simplify um, and make life better for everybody and make beautiful public services. So uh, I hope that was all understandable. <laughs> so thank you very much for having me. Um, and yeah, I made it here because it was a long journey. <laughs>